thank you very much, Scott. I feel a little bit like I'm trying to land a particularly large and strange Zeppelin at the end of this session, after all the other speakers have kind of bailed out in parachutes. Um, I want to talk uh, quite a lot, um, as the, the final session here, about uh, kind of technology as a multiplier effect and looking at um, what it means to improve reality on a kind of global scale. So thinking a little bit about kind of international development and stuff like that. Um, so I want to start um, by reference to uh, this man, Mark Zuckerberg, who in the last couple of uh, weeks has um, launched an initiative called Internet.org, um, which is a kind of very much framed as a humanitarian effort uh, to bring the next 1 billion, 2 billion, potentially even more online and into this kind of global conversation as a kind of fundamentally emancipatory and kind of humanitarian aim. Um, so um, in terms of the way that this, this initiative has been launched, it's got a very slick website. It's had a video um, with uh, like, um, representative samples from the everyday lives of the next, these next billion people who are going to come online, do, going about their business as we get excerpts from a speech by John F. Kennedy over the top. Um, a speech which, as it turns out, they've edited substantially cutting and changing bits to make their message stronger and kind of reframing it so it's talking more about kind of global community than what it was originally about, which was kind of like looking at cooperation in a Cold War context. So that, in, that kind of repurposing of an existing kind of speech is kind of interesting in and of itself. And then we look a little bit closer, and the partners here are all big companies with an immense amount to gain from this. So it's, it's being portrayed as this humanitarian initi initiative. They don't know quite what it's going to look like yet, but um, there's this sense that there these people have, these, these organizations have a stake in the outcome. As, as we talked about earlier um, in this session as well, it's like having exhausted their existing markets, all our eyes are on what is the next potential, whether that is the unborn, whether it's people in the developing world or otherwise. So um, this builds on an earlier example by Facebook of something called uh, zero.facebook.com or Facebook Zero. Um, which allowed people to access Facebook through feature phones rather than smartphones with them footing the cost of data connectivity on the assumption that all you could do is access stuff through their service. Kind of getting that set up as like the, the, the sense that the first time these people might be experiencing this kind of technology, this will be what is considered normal. And we also see how um, through the kind of phrasing and the initial setup, the way in which this technology will then be used is kind of being conditioned and shaped. So we have this notion of baby duck syndrome in human-computer interaction based on the work on kind of imprinting by various psychologists and animal behavior experts where it's like, as a user, the first thing you use will tend to be seen as normal. It's something that makes sense to you. And then attempting to unlearn something later is going to be necessarily more difficult. So we combine that with this kind of initial myth of Facebook as being created by college-aged um, people at a Ivory, um, Ivy League university. Um, and then there's a sense in which this context is the kind of very embodiment of something that's been recognized recently in psychology, which is this notion of an acronym called WEIRD, which is Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Developed. And people from that setting behave very differently to everyone else, basically. From like, being able to perceive optical illusions through the various value systems, thinking about time, thinking about language, we are the odd ones out, not the other way around. And then you think about like, the kind of psychological research that's being done, is tending to use like, college students on campus in the same location as where the research is being undertaken as like, the primary test subjects. And then it's like, humans are like this. No, college students are like this. So then we try and extend from, from this kind of model where it's like they're designing for their ideal user, who is probably something like them, as we've already explored. And now what we're seeing is an effort to get that technology to these people. Okay, just bear that in mind. Okay. So moving forwards, um, I've very much been thinking when trying to scope out this talk, um, the kind of question that's been haunting me is like the question of what it takes to leave a lasting impression in the world. Um, my friend Dan, who's speaking at Deconstruct tomorrow, uh, suggested that I maybe use this image in which the second richest man in Saudi Arabia um, wrote, literally inscribed his name in the substance of the landscape. Um, that's two miles wide um, as a sort of, source of, kind, of um, kind of scale there. And, and we can start thinking about this as kind of like a large-scale engineering undertaking. Okay? So we think, of two other kind of examples of this, we think about the um, uh, Panama Canal, 
which is kind of like vastly huge, it was a massive undertaking that kind of took between 1881 and 1914, in which case the people in charge of it kind of changed several times in terms of nations coming and going into existence and not just like individual companies or otherwise. Um, a thousand ships passed through it in 1914. In 2008, that was over 14,000. This is a huge piece of infrastructure. We can think about the Thames Valley Authority set up in the middle of uh, the Great Depression to reinvigorate a certain watershed region in the United States, with the government intervening to build dams, build key pieces of infrastructure at somewhere that was seen as economically underdeveloped, and thus kind of try and restore economic vitality to it. And this went on to be a model for the U.S.'s kind of approach to international aid, international development as a kind of ideal type. Um, we can move forwards and we can think about the Green Wall of China, which is an attempt to kind of contain the spread of the Gobi Desert and kind of combat desertification of areas that are otherwise going to be needed for people to live in. It was began in 1978 and is aiming to triple forest cover in northern China through a very targeted system of plantation. Um, all of these are examples of what I call charismatic mega-engineering, um, which is kind of direct analogy to the idea of charismatic megafauna, which is used in kind of conservation biology and ecology as a way of saying, like, look, these are the animals that we are familiar with as children, the ones we see at zoos, like the, the, the whales, the uh, pandas, the kind of eagles, um, and these are the things that people immediately understand and have an affinity to. Um, this is a good way of kind of leveraging public attention around stuff like climate change. We could think about polar bears. Um, but maybe it's not the most sophisticated or deep message. Like, who's going to want to save, like, various insects, things that aren't necessarily... If we're valuing, like, um, ecological diversity in and of itself, like, why, why, why use this message? It's a kind of quick and easy way to get eyeballs and get attention. Um, compared to that, what we're seeing also, like, is an attempt to apply the same logic, but in a much less visible and hard infrastructural way. So we have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and this is their entrance to the visitor centre saying, today's problems are solvable. Okay? So there's that attempt to apply the same logic, but the question of what um, validates Bill and Melinda Gates, the basis to start investing, like, they're doing a lot of good work, admittedly, but the, um, the kind of um, qualifications to be able to intervene on a global scale in some of the key and critical issues is that really based in his, the fact that he himself has been immensely successful in the world of software, potentially in the right place at the right time, or possessing some kind of superhuman entrepreneurial capabilities? Um, and then we can look at some of the other things they're funding, um, like a one million laser defense system to repel mosquitoes in the developing world, often in contexts where there isn't even a regular supply of electricity. So that's just the kind of way of like, looking at the way in which... Um, Often this is very solutions-oriented and other subtleties and nuances get lost in the process. We can also think about... Um, this was a case study from sometime last year um, called uh, the Haida Salmon Restoration Corporation. Um, the Haida, an indigenous people um, in Canada, um, kind of managed to lever their funding along with some kind of bank investment and bringing in some external businessmen, including this guy, Russ George, who had pre done previous work around, like, algae... Um, and other things along those lines around, like, um, intervening in oceanic systems. Um, he worked... He's pictured here on the boat of the singer Neil Young, for some reason, um, dumping a small number of iron filings into the ocean, I think, to look at the ways in which that could encourage oceanic growth of various things. And the kind of idea of this project um, that was under consideration was that by intervening in a natural system, they could encourage salmon to return by creating more foodstuffs and at the same time create a carbon sink. Um, and there was an attempt then to leverage that to make money through carbon credits at the same time as accessing it as a kind of humanitarian project. And at the end of the day, they managed to create potentially, although this is very, very much under um, discussion and debate, a giant kind of algal bloom which was picked up by NASA um, in international waters, so outside the reach of Canada. And needless to say, this was something that was reasonably unprecedented. They didn't have necessarily the right clearance. The funders had kind of thought that one thing was happening, something else happened, and there's been all kinds of controversy around this as a potential geoengineering experiment, like something that has the potential to have dynamic knock-on effects. And there's been a really amazing news story um, from Reuters over the last couple of days in which they directly interviewed this organization's lawyer, who was like, the authorities came in expecting Dr. Evil, and what they found were like a bunch of kids who were really interested in like various kind of oceanic systems. 
Um, but there's a potential here about like questioning who has responsibility, what is the accountability structure like, stuff like that. And we also have um, this kind of Google Loon set up, um, which is obviously, again, something else equivalent to like, looking at Facebook and Internet.0 is an attempt for something that was previously an advertising company, a search engine, now engaging in ridiculous, charismatic, hard engineering, creating a system of kind of moving um, network nodes in the stratosphere um, to ensure that people in areas of the world that would normally be able to get internet access can get it. Um, there are certain problems around this, um, such as the fact that no one really owns the stratosphere. So it might be a question of kind of first mover advantage. Who are we going to say that Google cannot use the stratosphere? Um, radio astronomers are up in arms um, because that could potentially interfere with radio signals and the kind of work that they're doing. Um, and there's like all kinds of strange and interesting questions raised here, but it's very much presented as a kind of fate accompli, where like sufficiently large amounts of data, why would you not want this? as a kind of global community. Um, there was a kind of XKDC comic that kind of amused me, and I couldn't work out why. Um, it's kind of infrastructure humor, and it's kind of funny, but sinister, and I, I literally can't work out what the source of the humor is. Like, very strange. Um, so then we compare Google Loon with Bang Info Ladies in Bangladesh, um, which is a, a kind of set up by an uh, NGO called DNet in 2008. Um, where they train a bunch of local women for three months in the kind of setup of how to use computers um, and then take them out into the villages in kind of rural areas that aren't otherwise they'd be able to be reached. Um, bundled in with this kind of ability to be able to access um, internet, um, Skype, talk to family members working in the Gulf maybe or elsewhere, is the kind of emphasis very much on kind of women and kind of reproductive health. Um, things that are kind of bundled together. So it's not just like the computer, but you maybe have the ability to buy things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get, like corner shop equivalents, medication, um, stuff like that. And this is kind of like a service that's kind of bundled together. So it's not just you as a user might not know what you're doing, but they will as a kind of human interface. They've been trained, there's expertise, there's services, there's potentially products, and it's kind of moving. And so this is a, a very different kind of infrastructure. Um, and we can see how that looks where it's like the, being explained to a group of women. It's not necessarily an individual experience. Um, you ha get the ability to talk to your community, find out what the community needs. And it's much more kind of embedded and kind of rooted in local kind of needs and circumstances. Um, so Jamae Cashio, writing in 2008, um, started to think, so, okay, to backtrack just slightly. So on the one hand, we have these kind of philanthrocapitalists like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have these kind of um, people intervening in the Earth's natural systems. We have um, giant companies trying to kind of um, productize, I guess, and extend their reach through kind of colonizing the upper atmosphere. And what I want to talk now is I want to talk about a kind of emerging class of individuals or groups that is kind of very much posed in opposition to this. Okay, so Jermay, writing in 2008, talks about the super-empowered, hopeful individual. So if technology is a force multiplier for ever, like for large companies such as Google or Facebook, it is also a force amplifier for individuals, for small NGOs, from kind of affiliations of like-minded individuals. And the, something that could have only been achieved by the state or a large company in days gone by is now something that maybe can be achieved by individuals working in the right way, using free tools or things like this. This isn't necessarily an unalloyed good, as we will see later. But um, the starting point for thinking about this is the notion of the kind of specific technological artifact, the Zimbabwean Type 2 bush pump. Um, this was the subject of an academic essay published in 2000 by two feminist uh, technology studies scholars, um, which is a really, really interesting piece of work um, in which they kind of start to consider what it might mean to feel love for a specific technology. Is that something that we can do? Does it make sense to talk about it through that way? It, that it seems like quite an odd proposition. Um, but like, so in the abstract there, what they're saying is like, we're investigating the specific technology to find out why it's an appropriate technology. In traveling to intractable places, an object that isn't too rigorously bounded, that doesn't impose itself but tries to serve, that is adaptable, flexible, and responsive, in short, a fluid object, may prove to be stronger than one which is firm. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Um, the guy who designed the specific type two iteration is a guy called um, Peter Roger Morgan, 
um, who started out as a microbiologist, very much interested in water and health, um, who kind of started kind of hacking systems, thinking about what, how this technology could be improved, what individual communities needed. They needed it to be legible. They needed it to be fixable. If a certain part of the system broke, it needed to be replaceable. It needed instructions so they could assemble it themselves. Um, but these, the, the two scholars who wrote this article suggested that he was the very embodiment of like, the feminist idea of a man. Having get, like, come up with this technology, he kind of ceded authorship which is kind of interesting. He kind of opened it up to distributed ac actions. He didn't impose it on others. He abandoned control. He let them adjust it, iterate it, sent it out in the world to do what it was going to do, as one of these kind of hopeful monsters maybe that Georgina and some of the others were talking about earlier. Um, and then, so from that ideal water pump type there, which is very legible, very easy to read, very moddable, we can start thinking about um, researchers in the UK that were working on... Um, a water pump that would have a kind of SIM card in it so it could send like a text message to a kind of central location or kind of um, point of expertise or repair um, uh, when it was blocked or wasn't working. And when we've, we've been talking a little bit today about the concept of the Internet of Things, okay, so that is often framed as being something that's probably going to be domestic, it's going to be kind of friendly, it's going to be something that's in these kind of shiny future homes. Um, but what would an Internet of Water Pumps look like? Um, we also have the idea of the brick, which is a project by Ushahidi, which I think Keller mentioned earlier, who started out doing crisis mapping in the aftermath of the Kenyan election of 2008. Um, and they are now looking at also like getting into this infrastructure space. Um, the brick is a um, kind of robust backup power hub for multiple devices. It's an internet provider. If the electricity grid goes down, it will continue working. It's got backup power. Um, and just generally being framed as the easiest, most reliable way to connect to the internet anywhere in the world. While a lot of the previous examples we've seen are designed in one location or thought about in one location and then rolled out as a solution um, for everyone, this is something that has its origins in Africa and is they're like, if it works in Africa, it will work everywhere else. Um, so it's the, kind of that reverse flow, which is kind of interesting. Um, funded through Kickstarter... Um, which in itself is a kind of technology of empowerment and force multiplication, though it has its problems in itself as well. Um, and this kind of idea that maybe the power or influence, like what it takes to leave a lasting dent in the world is shifting from those with the most resources or the most power or the most influence to those who can marshal the largest network of supporters. Um, so this then kind of comes down to communication skills. It comes down to your ability to tell a compelling story, to attract attention, and to kind of get, pull on the emotional heartstrings um, and look at how it could work in different contexts and stuff like that. Um, one project that I've given quite a lot of a look to this year is Open Source Ecology's Global Village Construction Set, which is the project of this guy, Marcin Jakubowski, um, to develop 50 key machines um, with which it is necessary to kind of build civilization depend with which, on which civilization depends. Um, and this is like a wide range of different technologies, um, covering like, transportation, agriculture, energy, manufacturing, housing. Uh, he did a very short TED Talk, got lots of support from them, has been iterating at a farm that he's been running. Um, he got support from the Mark Shuttleworth Foundation with quite a lot of money from that, who was the guy who founded um, Ubuntu and has been since a space tourist. And there's the kind of like certain actors, actors who are perhaps more traditional but who are supporting things that work in a very different way as well. Um, one of the interesting things about the kind of open source ecology kind of approach to things is that while there's a wide range of stuff, what they're trying to do is kind of op like publish all the plans and schematics online openly. They're quite ambivalent. It's not a humanitarian effort. They're just posting it there, letting users do the rest of the work. Again, there's questions and problems around this maybe as well, but we'll return to that later. Um, so, yeah, but, like, they've been using, again, some of these kind of agile methodologies, some of this kind of crunch time from kind of maps perhaps more familiar from the kind of Silicon Valley area, but combining that with hacker culture, combining it with all kinds of other weird influences that you might not expect, and kind of managing to get these machines, prototypes made, iterate, publish all their documentation. They've got, like, a 1,000 true fans who are subscribing out of a kind of more charitable donation kind of setup as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, then we have the project uh, Wikihouse, which is being run out of um, Hub Westminster in London, um, which is a kind of similar kind of approach to things, but looking at that through architecture. Um, this is kind of a flat plane of laser-cut uh, plywood that can then be assembled using no kind of external 
um, kind of nails or screws. Um, it's all kind of done through joists that kind of fit together. Um, very much in that kind of Ikea way where the, um, the instructions are there, you kind of do this, and um, it all kind of forms the initial shell that you can then add and mod as you want. But they've been kind of iterating as they go along. This is kind of like one of those species diagrams that maybe we saw earlier where it's like it starts off with point one and then kind of evolves in various different and interesting ways. And like they're very much, again, ceding authorship to the community where it's like you can build on what they've done. There's like a capillary branch down below, which is like a kind of row of open source desks and kind of other bits of furniture. It's being used in various different ways. There's a blog I'm currently following through Tumblr um, where two architecture students are trying to build their own as a kind of part life hack kind of situation, part finding a project, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, so there's all these different kind of currents running through that suggest there could be some kind of change kind of in the work. What, what does it look like if all these different things start to happen simultaneously? How do they interact? And we're also going to assume that like, the big companies and the philanthropic capitalists aren't necessarily going to leave the stage. We've got Brazil, Russia, India, and China coming in with economic development that isn't necessarily like projects buying up land in Africa, building various bits of key infrastructure, eyeing up the Arctic for kind of shipping routes and stuff like this. They're not just going to fade back into the background, but they're not motivated by humanitarian aims so much as these kind of mutual win-win scenarios. This is kind of quite a crowded and complex landscape. Um, so in this context, we need to think a little bit about what is an appropriate infrastructure? What is an appropriate technology? Is this open source tractor an appropriate technology if the users at the far end can't access the materials or aren't literate enough in engineering or there isn't an obvious point of entry for them? Um, is that something that is appropriate? Is Bitcoin an appropriate technology? Um, I think Keller again mentioned M-Pesa earlier, which is a kind of mobile phone currency and banking solution. Um, again, native to Kenya originally that is now spreading more widely in the region in India and elsewhere. Um, and uh, like within the past couple of months, they've had interactions with Bitcoin. Um, the idea that something that is, relies on these kind of vast computer processes mining away, crunching various complex kind of calculations and exerting kind of ridiculous levels of kind of energy use um, as an appropriate technology seems somewhat absurd. But then within the last couple of weeks, we've had Barclays in the UK stopping doing international remittances and the Somali community, which depends so heavily on that, like, freaking the fuck out, because, like, how are they going to get money back home? How are they going to make sure their family members are safe and secure and stuff like that? So in this case, maybe this is more kind of stable, robust. Um, it's got a built-in redundancy. There's kind of some sense here that it may be more fluid, more, able to be more use, used more in different ways. Is an AK-47 an appropriate technology? Appropriateness doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. This is cheap. This is robust. It's easy to use. People know how it works. It's clearly succeeded for a reason. And there's a difference here in which morality is not, and appropriateness are not necessarily the same thing. It does what its task is. And we can also think maybe about whether Facebook is an appropriate technology. Is it fair that the personalities and social structures of an elite group of college-age uh, students are now conditioning the use pattern behaviors of farmers with smartphones in the developing world? And finally, is Google Loon an appropriate technology? charismatic, it's ballsy, it attracts our attention, but what situations does it work in, when does it fail? And to kind of finish off, I just wanted to kind of um, demonstrate this point, which is a kind of spoof done by a bunch of Africans um, who are like, trying to organize a charity single to send radiators to Norway. So on the one hand, I, I urge you all to check it out because it's amazing, um, but on the one hand, this works really effectively as a piece of satire, um, and it's clearly something that is tackling an a problem that we're all very aware of, but it also highlights this kind of infrastructure problem. A radiator is merely the kind of tip of that whole iceberg of supporting structures. Yeah? What are we sending out that way that is the similarly a kind of issue, has the same issues, although similarly inappropriate? Thank you. <laughs>